Hello, everyone. Welcome back to MCOIL One on One. With us here today is Oklahoma Representative Forrest Bennett, Assistant Democratic Minority Leader for the Oklahoma House. Representative Bennett, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I guess let's hop right in. I feel like you kind of came to NCOIL around the same time. I started as an intern in 2019. When did you first get involved? My first uh, meeting was uh, the the winter meeting in 2019 in Austin. So uh, was that your first meeting? Uh, I think I might have been one or two after that. But OK, so I was still the new guy. Yeah. So that was my first one. And, and I didn't realize at the time that that was like the sort of that's the bigger one every year. And so then the next one I came to, I think I might have missed the spring meeting the following year, but I did go to the next summer one. And now I've gotten to the point where I, I try to make it to the spring meeting, even though we're uh, in session. But yeah, that was my first one. And uh, it was great. Enjoyed it. Yeah. And I'm How did it uh, come to pass that you got involved? Uh, I'm on the insurance committee and um, I uh, found myself actually getting involved. And I know you'll ask me about later about my other work uh, in insurance, but I got sort of fell into an insurance job outside of um, the legislature because in Oklahoma, we have a part-time legislature. Most um, most legislators have something else that they do um, to make, uh, you know, a living wage to, you know, if they've got family or my wife and I want to have kids and, and do so like that. So anyway, got involved in, in insurance. And so when I saw, I guess, because I got on the insurance committee, I, be, I started getting correspondence from Incoil about attending meetings. And so I thought, oh, just a great way for me to kind of continue to wrap my brain around the entire industry. Uh, and so took advantage of that. And, um, and that's how I got involved. And I really do. I, I enjoy it so much because I, I know for a lot of people, it's like a nerdy, boring topic, but I enjoy it. And, you know, it's one of those issues that you really do need um, subject matter knowledge on as, as a policymaker. And I've, um, you know, I've come to rely on certain members of the legislature for for whatever issues, um, you know, people who used to be home builders on on issues of like code enforcement and things like that. Um, former former attorneys on things like, you know, how, how to best um, design statutes. So it stands to reason we should have experts uh, for insurance. And I try to be that for my caucus um, and I try to be a resource for, for folks across the aisle, too. Um, and being involved in Incoil has actually helped me develop an even better, closer relationship with our insurance commissioner, Glenn Mulready, who's a Republican. He and I served in the legislature for two years together. And so um, it's certainly strengthened our relationship and kind of made kind of made things less partisan in that department back home, which is nice. I see. Yeah, we know Commissioner Mulready is a big uh, friend of the organization. So that's great. How uh, long were you in the legislature before you started coming uh, to meetings? So I got elected in uh, November of 2016. So um, uh, took took my seat there at the end of 2016. So three years. I was in the second year of my second term when I got involved. Um, and we have six year or six term term limits in Oklahoma, 12 years. Uh, and that's a hard limit. So you can't do 12 in the House and then flip over the Senate and go back and forth. So um, yeah, I think my only regret with regard to incoil is that I didn't get involved earlier because it's kind of truncated my ability to um to fully um you know be involved but i've 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 already started thinking about ways for me to be able to continue being involved once i'm i'm no longer in the legislature um whether that's that i try to try to become insurance commissioner here and do it that way or or through something else but i've really enjoyed the people that i've met yourself included thank uh, you thank you and, uh, and so i hope to stay involved that's awesome all right so uh, backing up a little bit how did you first get involved in public service you know, to a degree, it's in my blood. My grandmother was the first woman elected county commissioner in the state of Oklahoma. Before her, women had been um, appointed to fill the the remainder of terms for their husbands or um, family members who had died or become incapacitated. But she she did that for 18 years, and um, she retired like the year I was born. So um, it's not like I grew up with immediate knowledge of that, but it's and it skipped a generation because my parents weren't involved or interested in politics much. Um, but it was just so something I was sort of drawn to from an early age. Uh, and when I got older and when I was in college and volunteered on campaigns and with sort of issue organizations, I started, um, you know, I started getting involved in nonprofits in my neighborhood, uh, in my city here in Oklahoma City, where I live. And, um, and so there was a desire to be involved in politics. And then I developed sort of a set of um, 
frustrations about what I was seeing around me and how much better I thought we could do for the people of Oklahoma City and Oklahoma generally. Um, and so I ran for the legislature in 2016. And, uh, and um, like I said earlier, insurance became um, a topic of interest to me later on, but it really kind of, uh, it really pairs well because my, my focus since I've been in the legislature has been on eradicating poverty, basically, for lack of a a better phrase. And, you know, that encompasses a lot of different uh, subject matter areas, but it all boils down to one thing, protecting yourself against future um, possibilities. And that's insurance. I mean, it, it, at the most basic level. And so when I go to these meetings, I get to talk to, you know, it's it's that, but just specifically um, insurance related. But, I, you know, I get to hear from people, regardless of party, just kind of talking about you know, things that are coming, coming our way, uh, ways that we need to address uh, certain issues. And there's a lot less partisanship in it simply because um, it's pretty straightforward, you know? Yeah. Was the legislature your first elected office? Uh, were you at any other levels before that? Yeah, it was my first, I mean, I uh, was on, I was in student Congress at OU, yeah. at the University of Oklahoma. Um, the the uh fighting sooners doing so well this year. uh and they did really well every year that i was at ou by the way uh, and i was in you know i was student government president in high school but beyond that no this was my first uh my first elected uh, job nice um so what issues i know you said like kind of eradicating poverty what issues have you like been mostly uh focused and working on uh throughout your time in legislature yeah food insecurity um opportunity for uh, working class folks, um, the uh, social safety net that we provide or lack thereof and how we can optimize that to make sure that we're keeping up with the needs of, um, of, of Oklahomans. And, and in that, and so, you know, in the way that that intersects with, with insurance, we've, we've had a lot of discussions like many states across the country have in the last several years over how to administer things like Medicare and Medicaid and, um, you know, it all it all kind of comes back to that. Um, so, transportation also has been a big thing that I've focused on: uh, mass transit and, and and pedestrian transit, cycle infrastructure. Because I'm a cyclist, um, and uh, and there's also an intersection of insurance there. I mean, it, it touches every everything that we do. So, um, it's been kind of interesting to learn and immerse myself in the in the world of insurance um with all these other things that i've prioritized already in place and sort of see how see how it works there and then you know as since i'm doing it from the private sector and also learning about the regulatory side of it over here it's just been it's been a lot of fun it's it's like when i was running for the legislature um, back in 2016 i was also in grad school getting my public administration degree and so um, my master's of administration. So I was like studying policy at the 30,000 level, uh, level, and then I was seeing the effects of it. Anyway, so uh, so that's, it's kind of like been the same way with insurance is that I've, I've gotten to see the industry side of it, and I've gotten to see the regulatory side of it. And then, and I know you want to talk about the, the, the non-legislative, um, non-elected folks that come to the meetings, um, being able to communicate with them and kind of sit down with them is always really great. I mean, I, again, that's going to sound strange to a lot of people, but it's good. It's good to be able to talk directly to the folks who know the ins and outs. Um, I mean, just just like I value the presence of lobbyists and government liaisons at the Capitol, I, I value their presence at the meetings because sometimes, and some politicians will say this, but sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure, you've never picked that up, you know. <laughs> Must have been a busy couple of years for you if you were running uh, for the legislature and being in grad school. So give you credit for that. Yeah, well, I've just kept it going. I got to do at least two two things that should take all of your time at once. Fair enough. Great for my health. There you go. And so outside of the legislature now, you recently opened your own insurance company. How does that experience both, you know, owning an agency and starting a small business have when it comes uh, to your work in the legislature? It's much harder to do uh, because I'm in the legislature. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's the most shocking is that like my involvement in insurance at the legislative level has outside of my, my knowledge of things um, 
has not helped me at all, which is good. I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you really should not benefit from your legislative service in any other, in any other way uh, in your life. And I mean, outside of being enriched by that experience, and I'm certainly enriched by that experience all the time. Um, but uh, it's, it's been, you know, to the degree that, that I think about something that happens on my, in my legislative job or in COIL, when I'm selling insurance, it's only, oh, these, I know these limits are set to go up, you know, in the next yeah. year. So I should probably let my clients know that that's probably coming down the way. So that's kind of interesting to, to any client that has the, you know, the interest or the time of day to listen to me bloviate about insurance changes. <laughs> um, but it has been, um, I mean, being in, being a part-time legislator and, and starting a business uh, is a wonderful experience because I do have, uh, you know, when, when things get too tough, you know, or I get too overwhelmed with, with the business, um, I can kind of look at my legislative stuff and say, okay, is there something that I, you know, some stuff I need to check off the, uh, the to-do list. Um, and then kind of allows me to recharge, to go back to do the other stuff. Um, but it's been, it's, it's really kind of experiencing the industry from all these different angles has been fun. That's awesome. So you've garnered some significant media attention over the years for some of your big speeches on the floor of the house. Um, what do you think it takes to be an effective legislator to communicate your message uh, for your advocating for? I, again, I think the, um, I can tie it back to insurance in that if you're in the industry, if you're immersed in it, just like if you're immersed in public policy making, uh, you can oftentimes talk over people um, or talk past them because you're talking about specifics, minutia, um, throwing out acronyms that people don't understand and abbreviations and things. Uh, and, you know, we see that at the meetings when somebody has to go, can you, can, sorry, can you go back and just tell us what all of those things you just said mean, you know, uh, and we're all frantically writing them down. Um, that's, that's kind of a, uh, uh, yeah, my, been my experience. I lost my train of thought there, to be honest with you, Pat. Fair enough. Remind me what what it was that you had asked me. Uh, like effectively communicating a message. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Across. That's funny. I, I lost track of communicating with you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I really think it's it's tr it's making your uh, case as um, uh, uh, making it resonate as much as you can with with the people that you're, you know, that are listening to you. I, I do, ha I think the benefit of being in the minority party in a state, regardless of whether you're a Democrat in a red state or a, a Republican in a blue state is that um, while the majority party is spending a lot of their time speaking about the details and the minutia of legislation, um, we, we spend a lot more of our time talking to the public and, um, uh, and echoing their they're more sort of every man concerns about whatever legislation is being discussed. And so, and then when, when Republicans in Oklahoma talk about their successes, they kind of list off the legislation that they've passed and what, what that does. Democrats are able to really communicate more broadly. Well, what does that mean for you? You know, we, this legislation was passed at the end of the day, this is the effect it's going to have on you. And I think um, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, but uh uh, it's important to speak to people where they are. And um, oftentimes, if government is not speaking to you in a way that you understand, you begin to think that government doesn't care about you. And oftentimes we are, regardless of party, really doing our best to try to figure out what's best for our constituents. Um, but if we can't effectively communicate that we're trying, um, we're not doing a good job. And if we're not making it very obvious that we're listening to, we're not doing a good job. So uh, that wasn't your question, but I thought I'd add it in. <laughs> That's great. So I guess shifting gears a little bit, um, how would you describe your overall experiences throughout the years with NCOIL? I've really, I've had a great time and I've, I was welcomed. Um, I remember the first night and I've told this story a couple of times before, but I, I remember the first night of my first NCOIL, I got myself invited to dinner with some very seasoned um, in-coil attendees, one of whom was like, I think the immediate past president uh, of the organization. And um, 
and so it was it was cool to listen to them. I had gone to the National Conference of, of State Legislators before, and I, I enjoyed that conference. But I remember one of the guys at the dinner saying, I don't even go to NCSL anymore, the National Conference of State Legislators, which is, for those listening who don't know, a, a massive, uh, you know, national um, conference that legislators come to from all over the place. And um, there's tracks for different things, for different interest areas, for different leadership um, positions. So it's sort of like Incoil, but for every issue. Incoil is just focused on insurance. And he was saying, you know, I really like that we actually get work done here, you know. Um, and I didn't know much about the structure of things at the time because it was my first day. But we we have different different committees and you you work with your committee and the members of, of your committee from all over the country on this legislation because um because it affects it affects everybody and and you really do get to be a part of the conversation in a way that I would even say is um it's more 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 meaningful sometimes than than what we do at the state level because I really feel like regardless of my party label I'm able to make a a difference and my 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 viewpoint is being um considered I'm not saying that that is never the case in Oklahoma, but when you're a part of a super minority here, it's, it's, you don't feel as much a part of the process as you do when you're just a member of a committee and you really have to listen closely um, to hear any partisanship at all. If, if there is any, I mean, and it really does only depend on the issue. Um, most of the time you really can't tell. And uh, I've, I've found that to be one of the most rewarding um, parts of, of participating. That's great. So do you have any uh, key takeaways maybe that uh, you've had throughout your time and how that could kind of tie into encouraging more legislators to start attending and getting that experience? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I really do believe, and I, and I say this a lot back home, uh, that we do ourselves and our, and our constituents a disservice when we don't take seriously uh, the work of, of diving into um, a subject matter that we're, that we're addressing. And, few subject matters are, are more important in that regard than insurance because we're dealing with people's lives and livelihoods and um and inquo makes that really accessible i mean you're there and you literally have in the room uh someone who represents whatever you need to to talk to i mean and i've i've been able to get answers much quicker than uh than i would from my desk at the capitol so uh and i mean and and again in this hyper-partisan environment, and I, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool progressive guy in Oklahoma and, and focus, you know, a lot of my time on on making the case for progressive issues, but at, at, at the inquo meetings, politics is really taken out of it a lot. Um, and I use, you know, issues like climate change as an example. Um, you know, we can argue about the, the rate of change. We can argue about, uh, you know, who's most, you know, at, at fault. Um, but when you're talking about that issue at Incoil, you know, the, the, it's settled fact that things are getting more dangerous in some areas and we need to account for that. And, um, and I find that fascinating because, because so much of what state legislators have to do in, anywhere in, in the United States is, is wade through the BS in, in order to get to that conversation. And it sometimes doesn't even come to fruition, but at, at, at these meetings, it does. And um, I find that very rewarding. It's, it's sort of like you get to come to this thing and at least in this one issue area with this group of people, uh, you get to make actual change. And this is change that's going to, that's, that's going to outlive my legislative career. Um, because when we vote to uh, approve model legislation that, that people then take back to their states, um, you know, my fingerprints are on that. And I think that's pretty neat. Nice. Do you see in Oklahoma, like around insurance issues, is that partisan or is that less partisan at a certain super minority? But, you know, is that politics kind of removed more so from that than other issues? Well, yeah, I mean, I, f I found that I found that I'm one of the only Democrats that, that's sort of able to speak um on that issue now with with the level of knowledge that i do which is great but i found that um i i found that i i guess the industry attracts uh more republicans than it does democrats and i don't necessarily know why that is um but but it's been an opportunity at least for me 
uh, to escape from my partisan role um, because I've I've worked with you know the insurance commissioner on things and with the Republican um, chair of our, of our committee on things and um, and we've had arguments too but they've been intelligent ones you know and, and ones where everybody's where everybody's kind of reading from the same uh, set of facts which is which just can't be said of of every other issue um, not just in Oklahoma but everywhere so that's a good point. So um, what do you see in your view as benefits for like industry and consumer representatives to come to meetings? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it echoes just how how it matters to have liaisons and lobbyists in the in the building for um, for day to day state legislative work. Um, you know, the the original intent, you know, of of representative democracy was that we would come to the place of, of um, deliberation fully understanding our constituents needs and the system and that uh, in industry uh, interest groups and lobbyists got involved to make sure that um, the facts were well represented from from their industry standpoint so that we were making decisions um, we government making making decisions with the right set of facts. Ever more recently, that is just not um, you, you're not getting always the quality of legislator, um, and you oftentimes get uh, contract lobbyists who can be shady and 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 sort of one sided in the way that they do things. So when you come to Incoil, you uh, are immediately dealing with people who have chosen to take a week out of their life to come think about insurance for a week. And you are speaking to industry uh, employed folks who, who've come there, whose job day in day out is to make sure that, um, that what their company works on uh, is that they're able to do that. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, we listen uh, and, and do the bidding of the, of the, you know, um, industry representatives when they're there, but it it certainly helps to have them there to um, give us feedback. And I would also say, you know, um, I'm regularly amazed at my day job. I mean, at, at the legislature, when I when I see this wealth of knowledge in the lobby, and all of these just half truths and, and made up statistics coming out of the mouths of the people in, inside the chamber. Um, at Incoil, there's a legitimate uh, ebb and flow of, you know, what do you think of this legislation in your state? And, you know, coming from an industry uh, representative or, you know, questions like, you know, how will this product work in our state with its unique environmental issues or whatever? Um, it's just a pure, more policy focused conversation than it is a partisan one. And, um, like I said, it's just a refreshing thing to be able to do three times out of year um, or more when I when I get to kind of escape the hyper partisan mood uh, that may exist in my state and, and come be around people who are just dealing with mind numbing, boring issues that are very, very uh, interesting to me. Fair enough. Uh, do you have any favorite like model law or issue you've worked on uh, throughout your time? Well, I, this is, I mean, a little, a little controversial, but I remember sitting in a, um, in quote, put on a, a meeting, uh, a session about um, gun violence and, uh, and liability insurance and uh, the intersection of police and, and, and people. Uh, and I, I thought that was just a really fascinating meeting. And it was a fascinating um, idea because we're, we're, looking at an issue that really makes people immediately retreat to their respective partisan corners usually but in this room in this moment we were not we weren't taking that angle it was an entirely different angle uh that of of risk um mitigation and uh so it forced everybody to look at the issue differently and i and it and it kind of uh a light bulb went off for me about about being able to use um being able to look at other issues from the lens of insurance 
and seeing how that can be used as an effective tool to encourage the right behavior, just like we do in, in every other um, way that we design policy. So uh, that that was one that I really enjoyed. And then there have been, I mean, the conversation around like paid family leave that we had a couple of sessions ago was really uh, was really uh, heartening because you had people, again, of both both parties asking really important, good questions that obviously we're seeking to get to the bottom of how can we effectively provide this. You know, it wasn't a conversation about who deserves this and not. It was how can we make sure that everybody um, from the employer to the to the employee to, you know, society writ large is is benefiting in a net positive way from this. And um, so I look forward to, I mean, it's like almost every meeting there's there's one of those that I that kind of sticks out to me that I'm excited about. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that what that is uh, in November in New Orleans. Yeah, that's great. We're about one month away, so it's fast approaching. Yeah. So uh, we discussed all the positive things about Encoil, of course, but of course there's always things that uh, we can do better. What do you think are some steps you'd like to see Encoil go for in the future uh, to improve? <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I was thinking about that, uh, how to answer that earlier, uh, because I can't think of a, a negative thing, but but I, I guess when I was explaining what I kind of fell into on my first night at my first meeting, maybe formalizing that, uh, giving giving the new attendees an opportunity to um, listen to and, and interact with people who've who've been there before in a more casual way. Right now, uh, it's sort of the prerogative of the of the attendee to find a way to that meeting room where uh, first time attendees are, and that was nice. Uh, because I remember doing that. Um, and then I remember like skipping a couple meetings and then doing that again, just because I wanted to, and then, you know, the other people who were in that room, you can kind of spot them at the, at the event. Um, but if it's, it was a more formal, formalized way of saying, Hey, this is your first time, you know, we, because it's obvious, you know, when, when people show up to this meeting in coil wants you to stay involved, which I feel that, and, you know, I felt that when I left, uh, but, but it took, me being a little bit um, proactive, I think if if you the, yeah the the one note I would have is um, really cool bond like uh, networking happens organically uh, because of the opening night thing. If you do just a little bit of work to formalize that process, uh, I think members like me might might come into the second meeting already with with um, more wherewithal about how things work. Great answer. Taking notes here on that. Um, all right, so now we're moving to our lightning round question. These are a real hard hitting right. question. So, uh, favorite all time movie? Yeah, this is a tough one. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to say uh, Talladega Nights. Great choice. Such a good movie. Uh, all right, favorite all time actor? I mean, this is now like w Will Ferrell is the one that comes to mind, and uh, and now we're, we're the same movie. So. Uh, I hate that because I, there's there's so many more, but this is the lightning round and that's what came to my mind first. So. <laughs> All right, there we go. Favorite food? Pizza, hands down. There you go. Favorite book or author? Uh, so, love the Harry Potter series growing up. That was a really uh, um, foundational thing for me. And then also there's this British author named Jeffrey Archer whose books are written perfectly for people with ADHD because it's at least two different stories happening at the same time. Uh, so when you're reading the book, you really feel like you're reading two books that kind of like inter intersect. So anyway, that's cool. Uh, all right. Favorite musical artist. Uh, the Beatles would be, uh, I guess, um, I have to say the Beatles. That's a great choice. Favorite all time TV show. West Wing. It's good. Classic I, answer. Yeah. Such a good show. It feels like I've seen it 10 times. Yeah. <laughs> then last one, three dinner party guests, living or dead. Hmm. Yeah, so that's Ben Franklin. Um, he's a fascinating guy. I want to know if he's as charming in person. Um, I, you people used to say the Queen. I guess living or dead. Um, I won't. Say, not the Queen. The like Mohammed Salah from Liverpool. I'd love to just like soccer player Ben Franklin, and then let's just add in like. Um, Betty White, that'd be fun. I think that'd be that'd a fun. Be great. Day. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, wow. I, I, I thought I thought way too hard about that. I got. Way too <laughs> <hard>. <laughs> you came to a good a uh, good conclusion there, so that makes sense. 
All right. Uh, this wraps up this month's Uncle 101 interview with Oklahoma Representative Forrest Bennett. Representative Bennett, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed it.